do you want to start sharing the screen because you're such a pro at this while I introduce you? Sure. Dr. Zibby Turtle is a Cassini Imaging Science System team associate and a Cassini Radar team associate. She's based at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. She received her PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona in 1998. Zibby has been involved with other interplanetary imaging systems. She was a team associate with the Galileo Solid State Imaging Instrument studying Jupiter's moons. In addition to being a co-investigator for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, she will be returning to Jupiter as the principal investigator for the Europa Imaging System on NASA's Europa mission. And today she's here to tell us about what's been up on Titan and has been published in the last year. Take it away, Zibby. Thanks. Um, so there's been an awful lot of Titan research published in the last year, and I'm only going to um, touch the very the very edges of that, but I'll try to give an, an overview of some of it, and then I've given some um, resources where uh, more results can be can be found. Um, so it's uh, it's been a really um, exciting year investigating Titan. This is our um, our graphic showing the flybys of all the different satellites in every year of the mission. Um, so here we are in the twelfth year of the mission, um, and. Uh, had several Titan flybys, um, and I'll, I'll show you results from some of those as well. Um, in addition, in the um, earlier part of this year, Cassini performed a series of maneuvers that will take it out of an equatorial orbit and back to an inclined orbit. So um, this sets everything up to perform the orbits coming up toward the end of the mission, where we have um, a series of orbits that approach Saturn just outside the F ring, and then the periapse is dropped in between the rings and the atmosphere, which is going to be absolutely spectacular for Cassini's grand finale. Um, taking this just from a Titanian perspective, the high inclination orbits are really perfect for observing Titan's high latitudes, and that's, uh, that's something that's going to be very, um, very exciting um, to be able to look down again on the North Polar region and the lakes and seas. So I'll be, I'll be talking about that a little bit um, as well, what's, what's going to be coming up. Um, the, uh, this, this is the last time we'll have, the Cassini will have been in an equatorial orbit. So we've had these low inclination flybys for the past, uh, for the past while. Uh, this is a, a graphic showing all the orbits, um, nicely color-coded for the parts of the mission. Um, so we are in the, um, the latter part of the solstice mission getting ready for the grand finale. So we're in the green orbits, and you can see we move back up to high latitudes. High, inc high inclination, um, and uh, then the gray orbits are at high inclination. This is a summary of the flybys uh, that we've had uh, since last July, um, starting with T112, which is a little over a year ago, um, all the way up to the T121 flyby that was yesterday. Um, and uh, we'll be anxious to get uh, the, the results back from that. The um, Radar data will be played back, and we'll start to get to. Um, there's a lot of processing involved with that, so we haven't seen those uh, those data yet. The raw images from this are showing up on the raw image website. Um, I'm told there may actually be clouds at high northern latitudes, so uh, stay tuned. Um, we've been anxiously awaiting the the pickup of weather at high northern latitudes, and maybe starting to finally see that. To put the Cassini mission into the context of Titan's year. Um, this is a, a calendar that Joe put together, um, starting with Saturn orbit insertion, Cassini, which occurred in the summer of 2004. And in Titan's year, that was the 12th of January. And each of the colored boxes here is a Titan flyby, or in some cases, two Titan flybys. Um, in Titan's calendar. And so in the nominal mission, we uh, proceeded from mid-January to early March. And then there was the Equinox mission, which um, appropriately proceeded through um, Titan's uh, northern vernal equinox. And then we pick, picked up with the Solstice mission extension. And we are in, in that right now. So T121, which occurred yesterday, is coming up on mid-June. So we've been um, at Titan now for several months in Titan's year, and of course for um, 
many years in, in Earth's years, but this has given us a really unique perspective to be able to finally um, assemble a data set that is becoming quite complete, not only spatially, but also temporally of Titan being able to see so much of its year. Um, I'll also point out that this time frame overlapped with um, the anniversary in the Saturnian year of the Voyager 1 flyby in late March and the Voyager 2 flyby in early April, again in the Saturnian year. So we have a little more to go. Um, just, just actually a couple of weeks, though, in Titan and, S and Saturn's year, um, coming up to the, um, the summer solstice, the northern summer solstice um, in that system um, uh, on, well, that's obviously the 21st of June in their, in their system um, coming up next, uh, next May is the summer solstice there. So um, getting on to some of the, uh, the updates that have been made in the last year. This is an updated map of Titan's surface at 938 nanometers. This is the IR wavelength that the cameras use, um, the imaging science subsystem uses to see through the, the haze and the, the methane in Titan's atmosphere down to the surface. And as you can see, it's almost, it's almost complete. Um, there's one gap um, on the sub-Saturnian hemisphere at uh, mid-northern latitudes. Um, and fortunately, we'll have an opportunity to fill that in um, in some of the upcoming uh, distant flybys. Um, so this is an equidistant projection. Um, all the data here, this is data through T100 that were compiled into this map. Um, so that's data taken up through a couple years ago now. Um, and it's all projected at four kilometers pixel scale. Uh, I included the, the URL if people um, are interested in getting to where these maps are, are located. Uh, this is um, the same data projected in with a polar projection polar projection and so on the left we have a view looking down on the north pole of the lakes and seas punga mare near the the north pole igea mare kraken mare fading off into the into the haze there at lower latitudes and then the south pole um with ontario lacus here um and a lot of the enigmatic <laughs> southern features um that although dark um for the most part don't contain liquids the same way we see at the north uh, there have been in um, more radar flybys as well, and the radar. This is um, a map showing um, radar data through um, also through um, about a couple of years ago through T104, um, overlaying on VIMS on a VIMS map of the surface. Um, so you can see how much we're filling in of the surface um, with the different instruments. So the cameras will have a, a global view, and VIMS will have a, a global view at varying pixel scale varying resolutions. The radar um, is over, I think with a, the radar SAR imaging is, is over 50% now or close to it. And uh, um, with yesterday's flyby and, and one more uh, radar flyby, we'll be uh, completing the SAR coverage um, in the next year. But we'll have quite a good, a good distribution of SAR data over the surface. And then we can um, combine that, of course, with the data at other wavelengths that do have global data sets. Radar takes um, data in, in, in many, uh, many aspects of the surface. So the, the strips here are, are the synthetic aperture radar. So that's the, the imaging, uh, a way of imaging the surface. Uh, the radar can also do altimetry, pointing straight down at the surface um, to, to get altitudes. And there's also information on the emissivity of the surface. Um, and this is a, a map that has been compiled with data from um, 10 years of the, the mission, so again, coming through 2014, a map of the emissivity of the surface. You can see um, the variability of the, uh, the emissivity. And in many of these, these small areas, uh, like um, this one here, Selk, Selk's here, um, Minerva, uh, Corsetti, and Synlap, what we're actually seeing, where we see these areas where the emissivity is really low, um, this has actually been suggested that this is uh, indication of volume scattering in the subsurface that would be uh, consistent with water ice in the subsurface. One of the tricky things about, about Titan, because the atmosphere has such rich hydrocarbon chemistry and all of that material precipitates out onto the surface, everything's 
pretty much coated in hydrocarbon material. And so finding the, um, you know, getting information on the material composition at the surface has been very, has been very challenging. The radar can see a little into the surface, um, depending on the, um, the nature of the material at the surface. It can see in a, a few meters um, if it's actually methane liquid, the way we have in some of the lakes and seas, as I'll show in a, in a few more slides, it can penetrate quite, quite deeply. But in the, the solid surface, it's probably only penetrating a, um, on the order of, of a meter or a few meters, which means it has a, we have a way of getting to information about the surface beneath in the, in the near subsurface, the materials in the near subsurface. And there, there are indications um, here that there, is, uh, that there is water ice in the near subsurface. There are also suggestions in the VIMS data, the spectral data from the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer, of water ice rich areas or water ice richer than, the, uh, than other areas that are, are hydrocarbon dominated by hydrocarbons. But um, um, that's only seeing the very surface. And again, there's always this, this material that's mixed in from the, uh, from the atmosphere precipitation. So we're getting information um, from the radar as well that helps us to constrain the composition. And given that we know the bulk composition of the upper crust of Titan is water ice, it is reassuring to come across evidence that is consistent with that. This is um, another, updated, another updated map. I put them, them all together at the beginning. Um, this is a slightly older version of the, the radar flybys. Uh, again, overlaid on the, the VIMS um, infrared uh, map of the surface. And what is shown here are all the mountains that have been identified and named on Titan. The mountain naming scheme is uh, mountains and peaks in Tolkien's Middle Earth. Um, so many of these are, are uh, quite familiar. Ironically, Dumons is not actually uh, the, largest, the largest one on, on Titan. The largest, actually, I'll go back to the context image. The um, largest mountain is in the Mithra Montes, the largest peak that we, the highest peak we've found is in this area here. Um, and there's this series of three ridges with, with reasonably high elevation. Uh, the elevation of the, the highest area, the highest peak that's been measured is 3,300 meters um, or um, almost 11,000 feet. So that's a, that's a reasonable peak, especially for a planet that's composed primarily of water ice, um, not, not as high as the silicate rocks, uh, silicate uh, mountains we have on Earth or the silicate mountains on Io that can get up to um, you know, several or over, um, over 10 kilometers high. Um, but still, for a water ice, um, for a water ice uh, planet um, where material can actually, where the water ice can actually flow over geological time scales, um, this, this demonstrates that um, there must be uh, endogenic tectonic activity that has pushed up these, these structures um, and has, uh, they are either young enough that they haven't relaxed or the, um, uh, or the surface has been cold enough to um, support them. This is a map, um, again, a recent map published this year showing all of the locations of ridges and it's overlain on a, um, an older map of topography data that's, that's been combined from all the different radar topography sources, um, information about the altimetry, and also um, uh, information about the topography that comes out of the SAR data. Um, there's a, a technique that's been developed to be able to pull, that, uh, pull information about, the, um, about altimetry uh, from each of the SAR strips. So there's a, a well-distributed amount of topography data, and there is, of course, some uncertainty interpolating between it, um, but this is the, uh, um, the, the best map that, that has been able to be pulled together, and many of these are, most of these are tied down with these peaks and valleys are tied down by, um, by specific data. So it's the areas in between the SAR swaths where, there's, um, where it's been interpolated. And so what, what this map shows, um, and you can see most of the mapping is done in the SAR swath, so the reason, you know, so there are um, ridges here and not here, and that doesn't mean there aren't ridges there. It means we haven't imaged them as topographic structures. But you can see uh, the the um, the ridges are concentrated. Um, there seems to be much more tectonic activity. Um, or, 
evidence of tectonic activity at the lower the lower latitudes, which doesn't necessarily mean there isn't tectonic activity at at, at other parts of the surface, but could it could be that those that there's a higher erosion rate at those areas on the surface, and so um, the uh, structures that are formed are more more quickly eroded. Uh, we know there's a lot of erosion on Titan by various means and um, having different erosion rates at, uh, at different parts on the surf of the surface um, is like, like we have on Earth is uh, to, be, to be expected and also helps us understand the, the way the system on Titan works and the relative rates of the, the different processes. Um, another publication uh, from this year is uh, Karkoschka and Schroeder, in which they've gone back and done very carefully photometrically calibrated processing of the images from the Huygens uh, DISSER instrument, uh, the Descent Imaging Spectral Radiometer. And so this is the result of um, going back and very carefully reprocessing those data. So this is a side-looking um, view, and this is down-looking. And the, the left um, on the, the left axis here, it shows the range from the Huygens landing site, so in, in meters from just next to the Huygens landing site, moving outward. And then this shows the, the azimuth um, from, the, um, from where Huygens landed. And again, um, in the side-looking view, you can see, again, they have, there's the, uh, the, the range looking outward. Um, so um, this shows the entire... Um, the, the entirety of the, the DISR images that were collected, um, including this very um, intricately incised region um, that was so familiar when we finally got the images back from Huygens um, and could see how, how in, 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 uh, in many places they have these very Earth-like structures on the surface. This is, again, um, part of that data set in the, in the Karkoschka and Schroeder paper. And this is showing the view from the landing site. This is true color. So this is, this is what it would look like as one was standing on the surface of Titan. And then there's a, um, this is the enhanced color view, bringing out more of the detail. And for scale, Eric um, put together the, um, an image of the moon at similar scale just to show the, the sizes of the, um, the features and how far out onto the horizon we're seeing. So these are, are you know, centi several centimeter-sized cobbles on the, on the surface of Titan. There's also quite a um, complete view, um, almost complete in the radar data and com almost complete in the, um, the uh, ISS data as well, um, view of the, the high northern latitudes. This is um, a radar uh, SAR data that has been um, color-coded so that the areas that are liquid show up in blue and the surface is shown in browns here. And then on the right, this is a, a map of surface emissivity. You can see that the emissivity from the, the lakes and seas um, is very high. And this information, again, can be used to get at the composition of the material. And knowing aspects of the composition of the material, it can also be used to um, put together a bathymetric map. So this is a map of the um, depth inferred for light GMRA based on the radiometry observations. So the, the depths from this, this is a, um, this underestimates the depth. Um, so it's the depths here are, the depths measured um, are at least, um, in this case, uh, 180 or so meters deep. Um, so we have this map, and I'll show a, another version that we can compare it to in, a, in another slide. The other information, um, as I said, there's information on the, uh, the composition of the material. And so from these and other um, data sets of, of Titan, uh, we know that, that uh, the MARE, especially Ligia MARE, is very, um, is, is quite predominantly methane. Um, we can also, they were, they were also able to infer um, in Elisa's paper the um, aspects of the, the composition, not only of the liquid, but also of the seafloor. And the suggestion um, based on these data is that there are um, some soluble materials, those are shown in green here, 
um, acetylene, hydrogen, cyanide, which are produced in the atmosphere, um, and these these will be present in the liquid. We see along the shorelines in many places, we see these evaporite rings, bathtub rings um, of evaporites, very similar to processes we see around lakes that are drying in places where, you know, playas where you get uh, lakes drying, drying up um, on Earth. Um, and then at the bottom, there's um, how, what they interpret as a, a sludge, a nitrile-rich sludge of insoluble material, um, including particles like haze particles that are coming out of the, at the atmosphere um, and, uh, and other materials that are, are insoluble uh, runoff um, where you have fluvial erosion, breaking rocks up, breaking rocks of ice up on Titan, and that material would end up um, as sand effectively on the, the bottom of the seabed. There, um, it's, it's also been possible to use not only the altimetry mode of the radar, but the SAR mode using the calibration information from the altimetry mode, the SAR data can also be used to derive bathymetry of the, the lakes and seas. So this is another, another set of data that is independently um, deriving depths of Ligia here, again, up to 200 meters deep. And uh, this is Ontario Locus in the, in the um, high southern latitudes, uh, which is much shallower. You can see it, it gets um, at, at most up to 90 meters deep. So it's a, a much shallower uh, region. And this, this is a case, you can't see it in the SAR data, but in the uh, um, ISS and the VIMS data, there's actually a bright rim around, around uh, Ontario. And that is one of these examples of, uh, of evaporite deposits, we think. And there are a number of those at high, high northern latitudes as well, that kind of deposit. Uh, based on uh, knowing the depths now um, of uh, some of the lakes and seas, and, and in fact in Kraken Mare, um, either there is um, too much absorption um, because there's a, a different component um, in addition to the methane um, in, the, in the sea, or the, the sea is too deep to see the bottom. We haven't actually seen the bottom of all of uh, um, in, in everywhere in Kraken, there are places where it, it seems that it is either too deep or has, has another liquid component. But um, knowing, but, but by putting together what we do know about the depths of the seas, there um, is about 70,000 kilometer, cubic kilometers of liquid hydrocarbons in the lakes and seas. There may be more in a subsurface reservoir, in aquifers, um, but what's visible in the lakes and seas account uh, adds up to about 70,000 cubic kilometers. So this is 35 times the entire terrestrial fossil fuel reserve uh, on, the, on the surface of Titan. Which means we're invading Titan next. There are also um, another paper that was published this year looks at modeling the circulation in, in Titan seas. We now have enough information to put um, to put into models of the circulation to, and in this case, what I'm showing is the surface current. You have to call a number on your phone. Sea surface currents, um, and in this case, they've, they've looked at two different examples, one where there's a high rate of precipitation and one in which there's a low rate of precipitation, and you can see um, there are different patterns set up in the, in the circulation there are a number of unknowns that, or a number of knowns, uh, uh, model parameters that can go into these, but there are a number of unknowns about, about Titan. So at this point, they don't constrain um, observations we've been able to make, but it, it shows the kind of detailed information that we can put into to models to understand Titan and to constrain, um, to be able to use to constrain aspects of, uh, of the lakes and seas. The reason uh, for the difference here, where you have the low and high precipitation rates, is the amount of, of methane. The, so this is showing um, color-coded the methane mole fraction at the, at the surface. Um, and in this case, where there's not a lot of um, precipitation, then you get a gradient um, where the, the higher precipitation at high northern latitudes, at the highest northern latitudes, you get the most methane at the top and you get less methane um, toward the bottom, uh, toward the, high, the southern latitudes. Whereas when you have a lot of methane precipitation, of course, that, that dominates. But it's, it's interesting to see how that, um, you know, how that plays into 
the um, and controls the type of circulation we get in the in the lakes and seas. Um, and there, it, there are a number of uh, of parameters, of course, that go into this understanding the evaporation rate and things like that. So there's uh, some very interesting potential to to be able to uh, um, explore the the seas on Titan. And of course, um, one of the things that's been very exciting about having um, such a long-lived mission is that we've been able to really watch the seasonal changes. Uh, I talked a little bit of, of Titan's, Titan's year before the, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 flybys occurred um, in the um, spring in Titan's year, and then Cassini was there a Titan year later, too, um, and, and has been able to make observations and see the sequence and how we get to that spring, those spring observations, you know, the conditions that, that Voyager observed. And in many cases, uh, happily, the Cassini observations made in, in late March, early April in Titan's year have matched what Voyager, uh, what the Voyager saw. So that gives us good confidence that we uh, understand the, that we understand that, you know, that part of the system. When Cassini arrived, it was, um, as I said, um, southern summer, uh, mid-January, and we saw storms at high southern latitudes. And as uh, northern winter started to abate, there was an, uh, we saw the dissipation, Vim saw the dissipation of a north polar ethane cloud. And then the haze, the detached haze um, that is, was so prominent in the Voyager observations um, of, of Titan um, started to drop in altitude and then eventually disappeared. Then in, um, as we moved further into spring, we started seeing storms at um, mid-latitudes, or not at mid-latitudes, at, at low latitudes, um, toward the equator. And then we really started to see things pick up in the, um, the southern, the south polar atmosphere as it moved into winter. Um, changes in the temperature, as the temperature dropped, um, the uh, development of a south polar vortex um, which uh, was seen early on by ISS and VIMS and has been more recently demonstrated by uh, Carrie Anderson um, to be um, a much, th that it is related to a much more extensive cloud at lower altitude that uh, is composed of, of nitrile ices. So be, we've been able to watch the development of that. The big question has been when the, the summer storms will pick up at high northern latitudes. And almost all of the models predict that those will pick up um, in spring, but we didn't actually observe that. Um, instead, we finally started to see the development of small cloud systems um, in uh, this this year, in calendar year 2016. But we haven't seen any large outbursts at high northern latitudes the way we'd seen at other at other parts, of, um, and that that had been predicted much before now. So that's been very interesting to be able to um, have these data to constrain the models to understand Titan's atmospheric circulation. So this is, again, the, the same calendar I showed before. And then this is a version that I've overlain clouds when we've seen different clouds. So the, the darker purple are southern clouds. And the lighter purple are um, northern <coughs> clouds, clouds in the northern hemispheres. And this, this just kind of goes through, shows when in Titan season we saw these different clouds. So as I said, we saw a lot of clouds at high southern latitudes early in the mission. We didn't see northern clouds at all until uh, mid-February, um, and then we saw a few, a few more. This is when we had the low-latitude clouds in April um, and the development of the south polar vortex, which has persisted. The last clouds that we've seen at southern latitudes were in April, and that's fairly consistent with the models. They hung on a little longer than we expected, but that's fairly consistent with the models. But what, what was really surprising was how few clouds there were in the May part, the May time frame of Titan's year and going into June. Most of the models predicted that we'd be picking up high northern clouds, high northern storms in, in the kind of April time frame, and that just hasn't, that hasn't occurred. Um, so as I said, uh, we've seen a few little clouds um, moving into Titan's June, and uh, we'll see what the T121 data have, have in store in the next, the next few days. Um, but uh, this is one of, the, one of the parts of the mission that's been um, quite intriguing. Another aspect of the seasonal cycle um, we have is the Sears data, Cassini's Sears in, in instrument, 
um, which observes at longer wavelengths. So this is measurements made at 19 microns. And at this wavelength, you can measure the surface temperature. And so these are, um, there's not a wide range of surface temperatures, but it does change, and it does change with season. And so each of these um, images is showing um, a two-year, an average over a two-year span. Um, so this is southern summer, right after Cassini arrived. And the highest temperatures were at southern, in the, um, towards southern latitudes. And then you can see this band moves moves northward as we move into northern spring. Um, as I said, there's not a big, a big variation. The maximum temperature that's been observed is 93 and a half kelvins. Um, the minimum temperature is 90 kelvins, so it doesn't change a lot. Um, but it's enough that this is an important parameter in understanding the atmospheric circulation, the behavior of the atmosphere, materials, um, methane evaporating from the, uh, um, from the surface as, as the sun moves northward. And so that's going to be an important component of these models. Uh, I don't know if this um, movie will work well over WebEx, um, but I did include the animation, the link to the animation in the presentation here, um, where they have a um, just an animation showing an average over each year. You can see again this uh, the heating moving moving northward, and it's been really really spectacular to be able to have such a temporally complete data set. Um, to really to really give us a lot of a lot of information to understand Titan as a system. Uh, so there's a um, a special icky, a special issue of Icarus uh, that came out just this spring, and I included the link to that. Um, there are uh, many papers in in that. Um, it's been a like I said, it's been a very good year for uh, for Titan results. There was also a, a workshop uh, just. Um, a month ago, um, on Titan's aronomy and climate, and I put a, a link there to the uh, to the abstract book for that as well. Um, but it's you know we we really have a um, a lot of momentum on Titan science at this point, and a lot of data that is finally being um, you know able to be compiled together um, to put into the the context of uh, of Titan as a as a system. And so there's um, although there are a lot of papers in this um, in this Icarus uh, special issue. There are also a lot of a lot of the research that I've that I've discussed here comes from other papers that were also published in 2016. So it's been a, a very rich year scientifically for Titan. So I did want to give a quick overview of what's coming up in the the last um, a little over a year left in the in the mission um, as we move uh, toward the uh, the proximal orbits here. There are after after yesterday there are. Five more close flybys of Titan, um, starting in um, in August. Another one on August 10th, not terribly long from now. Um, and then the last close flyby of Titan is T126 next April. But we also, because of this high inclination orbit, have these great opportunities to do observations of Titan's high northern latitudes, also high southern, but but it's not very well illuminated anymore, um, high latitudes during distant encounters. And once we get into the F-ring and proximal orbits, there are distant encounters with Titan every couple of weeks. And for Cassini's cameras, that's absolutely great. From a you know, few hundred thousand kilometers range, we can still get kilometer scale imaging of, uh, of Titan. So to do things like monitoring clouds, to monitor shorelines, to see if there are ch large-scale changes in the, the lakes and seas at high northern latitudes, for example, if there are storms, we will be able to do this, and we'll have a fairly regular cadence of observations. So this is the, the ground tracks of, of each of those distant encounters. And as I, as I keep saying, a lot of those have been are, or will be at high northern latitudes, which is very exciting. But there are also a number that that dip down to southern latitudes. Um, so we'll be able to get a view of what's going on in the southern hemisphere, uh, the southern um, atmosphere as it's moving into, uh, into winter. And then this is a polar view of um, looking down on the North Pole. And as, as I've said, a number of the, these distant encounters uh, look straight down onto, um, onto the high northern latitudes. And we have a great data set um, 
we saw this area before, and because there haven't been a lot of clouds, we saw the surface, and so we'll have a really good data set to compare to, um, to understand, to, to be able to detect surface changes if there are surface changes, and of course, if there are clouds, then we'll be able to um, observe observe the clouds. The other good thing about the distant encounters is that they actually occur fair, over a fairly long period of time. So we can continue to watch and look at the dynamics of clouds on the time scales of ours, assuming Titan cooperates and there are actually clouds, um, which we have learned not to assume. But um, either way, it's kind of a win-win scenario. We'll either have clouds and we can observe the, the atmospheric dynamics, um, or, or we'll be able to, uh, to observe the surface and see if there are any, if there are any changes as we move into to northern summer. So I will uh, leave, um, leave Titan here with a, an image from VIMS, a, a global image um, showing, uh, uh, showing the, the Titan's dunes and then the high latitudes where we have these orange areas that are um, uh, these evaporite deposits. And I'll take questions if there are any. <laughs> a reminder, please, if you're not speaking, to mute your microphone. But this is a very good time if you have questions to unmute your microphone and let us know if you have any questions for our speaker. And thank you, Zibby. But not the music. Well, <laughs> I, I, I did have one question. Um, Zibby, on page 17, when you were initially talking about the um, bathymetry and you mentioning that it underestimates the depth of the lakes. Could you explain why the underestimation? So with the with the radiometry observations, they're just putting a um, a lower limit on the the depth. Um, in part, that's because of the resolution. So this is a very um, a very low resolution data set comparatively. So if part of the you know the resolution element is deeper, you wouldn't see that. And so it'll, it's it's kind of showing an average. So there could be areas that are actually deeper that aren't av that that the averaging removes. But it's a very it's a very useful comparison to the. Uh, it's nice to have the, the you know independent ways of seeing the bathymetry to, to use as as checks because they are coming out with similar numbers. Um, the the um, altimetric profiles they have as well as the the SAR data and the radiometry. In one of your slides, I forget the number. You were showing the um, imaging, probably VIMS on the left and the radiometry on the right covering um, some lakes. Uh, and, uh, but I was wondering, though, um, there was a larger area, wondering whether the radiometry uh, showing a much larger area than the imaging of the uh, surface of that's it there. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that indicating that there's a whole lot of moisture, uh, methane or ethane, just below the surface, or is it more an issue of resolution of the radiometry? It's, it's probably, well, it's potentially both. There's definitely um, a lower resolution with the radiometry. Nonetheless, in some areas, uh, like Jingpo Lakas here, you can see that it's pretty well defined. Now, maybe these data are coming from the, the flyby data set. Um, are being you know from the same the same closed data set, but there is pretty good resolution here. In this area, I don't think it's just a, a, a resolution, an artifact of the resolution. I think um, this is this is um, in, in parts of this area. It's real it's real data saying that the surface em emissivity is high um, in between the seas as well. And and yes, that that could be indicative of uh, there being a saturated surface at uh, at high northern latitudes. Okay, we have time for one more question before moving on to our next speaker. Anybody else? Apologies for the music. All right, I'd like to thank um, Zibby once again for doing a marvelous roundup and for, um, I'm, I'm going to have to lengthen these because there's just going to be more and more Titan data coming in. So, so thanks very much. My pleasure. And um, now we're going to move on to our second speaker, and um, Ali, um, let me 
one moment while we get things set up. Okay, Ali, what I've done is I've given you control of the screen, so what you will want to do is click on the Quick Start tab. There you go. All right, so um, an introduction. De Dr. Ali Suleiman is a member of Cassini's Radio and Plasma Wave Science, the RPWS instrument team, which is at the University of Iowa. Incidentally, they're some of the nicest people that we work with, I have to say. He's interested in assessing the importance of plasma waves in Saturn's environment. Ali obtained his undergraduate degree in aeronautical engineering at Imperial College, London, and a short summer project with the Cassini Group in the physics department, which hosts the principal investigator for Cassini's magnetometer instrument, was enough to persuade him to pursue a PhD. Ali's scientific interest is in the solar wind interaction with Saturn's magnetosphere. He has worked particularly on Saturn's bow shock, taking advantage of the opportunity of Cassini exploring a unique regime of space plasmas and drawing parallels with astrophysical shocks, for example, supernova remnants. Ali, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, today I'll be uh, talking about one important result in the past year by Cassini, which concerns Saturn's magnetosphere. And uh, there is this long-standing problem of mass loading and unloading in the magnetosphere. So we know that Enceladus has a plume that continuously releases plasma into Saturn's magnetosphere. But the problem is, uh, for the last 10 or so years, is we haven't been able to um, balance the numbers in terms of all the plasma that's being loaded into Saturn's magnetosphere and all of the plasma that's being ejected to maintain equilibrium. So I'll start by uh, introducing the uh, structures in the solar system. Uh, so here is the connection between the sun and a magnetized planet, and in this case it's the Earth, but it's no different to any other magnetized planet. So the sun continuously blows off plasma, which is uh, different from the light that it radiates. This is uh, hot ionized gas uh, that is conductive uh, because it's so energetic. The electrons are no longer bound to the protons. Uh, and this is being propelled away from the sun and pervades the entire solar system and immerses every planet in it. Now, because this medium is conductive, it is able to feel the magnetic field of the sun and interact with it. By doing so, these plasma particles are tied to the magnetic field line, and so when they propel away from the sun, they drag along with it the magnetic field. And uh, this very, very important condition is known as the frozen-in condition. So this essentially means that if you had a blob of plasma that's being released from the sun, and you have a certain number of field lines threading this blob of plasma, which are indicated by the white arrows, as this travels away from the sun and expands, the same number of field lines thread that same blob of plasma. And this is the frozen condition. And this is important for the interaction between the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere. So a magnetized planet such as the Earth has its own magnetic field, um, and that presents itself as an obstacle to this incoming solar wind with the embedded magnetic field of the sun. And because of the frozen condition, these two media cannot mix. And so the plasma deflects and the magnetic field therefore drapes around the planet. So this is essentially the picture uh, on a very large scale for the magnetized planet in our solar system from Mercury, Earth, through um, Jupiter, Saturn, all the way up to Neptune. Um, now, of course, there are under certain conditions. Actually, before I get there, um, there is, um, these planets all have a magnetosphere. Uh, they all come in different shapes and sizes. And what exactly controls these? So the strength of the magnetic field essentially controls the size of the planet's magnetosphere. Uh, but also, uh, this magnetosphere is competing against the dynamic pressure of the sun, uh, of the solar wind that's incoming. So, for example, in Mercury, you have a fairly weak magnetic field compared to the other planets, but because the, mag uh, because the solar wind dynamic pressure is very high, because it's close to the sun, uh, 
the magnetic field or the boundary of the magnetic sphere barely stands off this incoming dynamic pressure. And when you go to the Earth, the magnetic field is stronger, and so you get a larger magnetosphere, which is able to push off the solar wind at a farther distance compared to Mercury, for example. So here we have the combination of the stronger internal magnetic field of the Earth that's competing against a weaker dynamic pressure compared to Mercury because the Earth is farther away from the Sun, of course. And then uh, Jupiter is the most extreme case where you have a very, very, very strong magnetic field and thus you have a very large magnetosphere and your incoming solar wind has a much lower dynamic pressure. You're a number of times farther away from the, um, from the Sun than the Earth. And so you get a very, very, very large magnetosphere. And if this were visible uh, to the naked eye in the night sky, the structure would be larger than the sun. And not only that, the magnetosphere stretches down tail. And an observation has been made by Cassini where the tail of Jupiter's magnetosphere uh, met Saturn, essentially. Now, Saturn is somewhere between the Earth and Jupiter. It is very, very strong. Uh, and it is 10 times farther away, and you have a much weaker solar wind, so you therefore have a very, very, very large magnetosphere. Now, uh, of course, uh, because of the frozen condition, uh, you, get the, uh, you get the magnetosphere acting as an obstacle to the solar wind, and that is on a very large scale. That is the picture you see. You have the solar wind coming in and deflects around the planet. But under very specific conditions and very small scales, uh, you can get interaction. So you can get where the interplanetary magnetic field from the sun merges with the planetary magnetic field line. So the picture here essentially is if you have anti-parallel magnetic field lines, so essentially they are oppositely directed. So say, for example, the red one is coming from the sun, uh, the, the interplanetary magnetic field, and the blue one's from the Earth. Uh, under certain conditions and under this anti-parallel condition, um, they are able to merge. And this process is called reconnection. Uh, and when they merge, what happens is that they break off and they reconnect and then they snap away to the sides. So you have, if you like, a reconfiguration of the magnetic topology here. And there's a conversion of magnetic energy to kinetic energy because when it snaps away, you get jets. So your plasmas that are tied into the steel lines get dragged sideways, essentially. And what can happen here, this is a mechanism by which plasma from the solar wind, because there's an opening here, uh, it is able to leak into the magnetosphere. So you get a transfer of momentum and energy from the sun directly into the planet. And this starts a cycle known as a Dungey cycle here. So all the mass needs to be conserved. I mean, you can't get all the mass that's being filled into the Earth's magnetosphere or Sun's magnetosphere forever. And you can't get all the magnetic field bands connecting with it. Every plasma that goes in at some point needs to go out so we can maintain equilibrium. So what happens is that the field lines, once they uh, reconnect in the day side, they travel over the poles and take the plasma with it along for the ride up until it gets to the night side. And then you get a second night side reconnection where you get exactly this process over here. You get plasma being ejected planetward, which leads to the generation of the aurora. And you also get plasma traveling anti-planetward, which effectively leads to a loss of plasma from the system. So over a very, very long time scale, you have an average size of the magnetosphere. You get inputs and outputs going on at pretty much equal rates, so you can conserve the mass of the system as well as the magnetic flux. Now, for Jupiter and Saturn, for example, um, another process takes place that's quite important, and this is known as the vassal unit cycle. Now, the difference between Jupiter and Saturn, uh, the difference between them and the Earth, for example, is that they are very fast rotating planets, and they're very, very, very enormous. So sometimes when there's mass that's going into this planetary system, they cannot rely on the Dungey cycle because it takes such a long time for the mass to be ejected from the system. So 
this process is triggered by the fast rotation of the planet. So if we're looking down the north pole of Saturn, you can see the prevailing rotation. So the planet rotates, the field lines are rotating with the planet, and the internal plasma in Saturn is locked to the field line. And so there's a prevailing pattern where the plasma flows around and it essentially co-rotates with the planet. Now, um, as uh, I haven't shown over here, but I will in the next slide, there's Enceladus that's also continuously in orbit around Saturn, and it has a plume and is continuously loading Saturn's magnetosphere with plasma, with water group ions uh, in, in this case particularly. Now, when that gets loaded, the centrifugal force um, from the rotation of Saturn will stretch them out. So here's a side view, for example. Uh, will stretch out the plasma um, in all directions. Now, on the day side, it will be confined because the plasma is being competed against the solar wind, so it can't stretch any further than the boundary. And on the night side, it can continue to stretch farther and farther and farther away from the planet. Now, there reaches a point where it cannot do that forever, and then the field lines the oppositely directed field lines of the planet become closer and closer together until they reconnect and snap away. And then you have the ejection of plasmoids, which is a mass a plasma-loaded bubble of magnetic field. And so this is an important mechanism for mass loss, more important than Jupiter and Saturn, and pretty much non-existent at Earth because Earth's rotation is a lot slower than at Saturn. Um, so... If we add these bits here, um, we have here the input of Enceladus. We have about 100 kilograms of water group ions per second, and this is continuous. It's happening all the time, all the time. And the big question is, you know, what loss mechanism processes take place to eject all of this water? Because the loss mechanism at Saturn or any planetary system isn't continuous. It happens at discrete times. Okay, and just uh, here's like a side slide that I've put. Uh, when you get the plume that's coming out of Enceladus, uh, they become, so it's water, a water group, uh, they become ionized. Uh, and once they become ionized, they then see the magnetic field of Saturn, and they're able to travel along it. And this essentially is manifested as a footprint. If you look at down the North Pole of Saturn, you can see the Enceladus uh, footprint here. Uh, on the aurora, uh, and this is essentially from the plumes that are coming out of Enceladus. So um, here's the summary of the picture. Uh, uh, the, this is just a cartoon of, of the whole cycle. So you have Saturn, you have the initial mass unloaded state, and at some time later, uh, with Enceladus continuously loading the system, uh, you get a stretched magnetic field. So, you know, there's a centrifugal force, and also just because the field lines, um, the plasma can't just escape the field lines, they're frozen into it, and so it expands and expands and expands. It cannot happen forever. Uh, the magnetosphere cannot just keep growing, 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 growing forever, because eventually the stresses in the magnetic field will give in. And then you get a stage where you get oppositely directed field lines. When they come closer and closer together, it's being stretched away. Uh, they connect and they pinch off the blob of plasmoid away from the planet. So you get an anti planetary kind of jet away and a planet towards jet. And then you're back to the mass unloaded state here. So <clears throat> here are conditions of Saturn. And this is, this is what the problem has been for a while. Uh, so I've just listed two plasma sources and two plasma loss mechanisms. Okay. So um, first, is the dungeon reconnection. Like I said, you get merging of the interplanetary field with a day side magnetic field. You get reconnection at some point here. It opens up the field line, there's a cavity, and plasma is allowed to leak into the planet. That is one way of loading the planet's magnetosphere. Another way at Saturn, like I said, is the moon. It's continuously loading, and this is so much more important, okay, because this is continuous, happening all the time. It doesn't really care about the conditions of the solar wind. For Dungy reconnection, you need the specific condition of the solar wind. You need the field lines to be at a certain angle, and you also need the plasma pressures, the plasma beta, known as the pressure of the thermal to the magnetic, uh, 
to be also at a certain um, condition for that to happen. So this is the most important, and we have a good estimate of it. Now for the plasma loss, uh, like I said, there's a Dungy reconnection, which um, follows up from the day side reconnection, where at the night side, when the solar wind goes for a ride around the planet, you get a night side reconnection. And then for the Vaselinus, which is associated with the fast rotation of the planet, stretching out the magnetic field line and eventually leading to the plasma. So it's clear that this is continuous and these happen at discrete times. And um, you know, over the last number of years, uh, these have been calculated and the numbers never really matched up. So there was always a lot more plasma that's been estimated being loaded by Enceladus into the magnetosphere. And uh, given the rate of reconnection that's been estimated and the content of the plasmas that are being ejected, uh, the numbers haven't really added up. I think there were about two orders of magnitude less. And this led to other mechanisms being proposed. So here I've put in some numbers. We have 100 kilograms per second by Enceladus, which is continuous. A plasmoid had a typical volume of 10 cubic Saturn radar, uh, and it ejects a certain mass, uh, roughly. And this, if you put the numbers together, amounts to 200 plasmoids a day needed to eject all of this mass that's being deposited by Enceladus. And this would equate to about once every seven minutes. Uh, now, this hasn't been observed. This rate, this is really, really, really fast reconnection going on, very fast rate. And we don't see it all the time at Saturn. So there must be something else going on, which was once thought. Other processes happening on the boundaries that are leading to the mass being lost. The thing is, we do know for certain that mass is being lost at Saturn, because if we measure the size of the magnetosphere, we can feed inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate, very mechanically. But we don't know how it's deflating. Okay? And, um, and so, like I said, other mechanisms uh, were proposed to contribute to this mass loss. So um, only up until recently, uh, a very important observation has been made, uh, and this is from one reconnection event uh, that essentially was a game changer and was found to be able to eject all of this mass that's being loaded by Enceladus. So here I'll digress a bit and I'll talk about the microphysics of reconnection and how do we detect reconnection, for example, at Saturn. So, you know, we're able to see these oppositely directed field lines, uh, but how do we know that these field lines are reconnecting at some point? So, Essentially, like I said, um, if we sort of go through a go through the motion of, of magnetic fields, so you have these two field lines, these oppositely directed field lines. They're merging closer and closer and closer together until it's thin enough, and they connect, and then they snap away uh, sideways, and, and there's a jet which essentially the field lines carry with it the plasma that's locked into it. Now. Um, the detection essentially comes from what's called hole fields, okay? So these are components of the magnetic field that are in addition to the background topology of magnetic reconnection. And this happens because the mass of protons and electrons are different. Now, the number of protons and electrons are the same, okay? Because if they're separated, there'll be an electric field that will bring them together. So this is condition is called quasi-neutrality. But the sizes of the mass and uh, the size of the proton and electrons are vastly different. So it's about 1,800 uh, electrons make up one proton by mass. So what that means is that they get magnetized, so they lock themselves to the field lines and they unlock themselves in the field lines. So they become magnetized and demagnetized at different length scales, and this is by virtue of their mass of their size. Mm. So what that means is as these field lines are coming closer and closer together there's a region, a much larger region, where the protons become demagnetized first, so they become unattached to these field lines. But the electrons, because they work under much smaller scales, they are still attached to the field line. So what happens between here and here? So the pink box is the region where the ions become demagnetized, and the blue box is where the electrons become demagnetized. So what happens between the regions where the ions are demagnetized 
and the electrons are magnetized. Um, it essentially you have the field lines traveling down, taking the electrons with it. They cannot take the protons anymore because they're not locked into it anymore. And what you get effectively is a separation, is you get a net uh, drift between the proton and electron. And that is effectively a current. So a current, all it is is a net direction of protons and electrons moving in different directions. And by convention, the direction of the current is in the direction of the protons and opposite to the direction of the electron. Now, we all know that a current induces a magnetic field. And because of the establishment of this current, we get the, this new component of magnetic field in this reconnection region, and this is called the whole field. And the detection of this additional component of the magnetic field is a diagnostic. that We are in the ion diffusion region, and we are very close to where reconnection is going to take place. So we don't really have to be here to detect reconnection. We can pretty much be somewhere farther away where we can detect these whole fields or even much farther away where we can see these jets, for example. So Saturn, um, paper Nature Physics by Arjital was the first uh, to be able to detect this ion diffusion region here. And uh, um, it's an important result because it shows that it happens in other planetary systems under different conditions. And of course, it's exciting for Cassini because in addition to it being a planetary mission, it's also told us a bit more about microphysics as well. Now, when this particular event, uh, when some calculations were made, the reconnection lasted for 19 hours. This was a very long duration reconnection. Uh, and this was, com compared to Saturn's rotation rate of 10.7 hours, it was approximately two. And the estimated mass loss was very, very, very high, and approximately three orders of magnitude than was previously estimated. And this is very good news because this means that we don't need this process to happen every seven minutes because we don't see the, such a thing happening every seven minutes. And if we put in the numbers together between what Enceladus puts in and what a reconnection event like this is able to eject out of the system, then we expect to see something around 40, 40 days to shed all the plasma, which is consistent with the rate at which we observe reconnection in Saturn. And so this essentially tells us that magnetic tail reconnection is indeed a very significant loss mechanism in a fast rotating planet. So, so it is as important as we thought it was very, very initially. Of course, we didn't see much of it going on, so we thought maybe it wasn't important. And now it is indeed very, very, very important. And this has much wider implications because it obviously, uh, uh, you know, we can extrapolate our understanding of, of, of these systems here, you know, which are very different to Earth, for example, when you have these fast rotating planets. And with Saturn, we've been able to understand how different, how remarkably, strikingly different these systems behave compared to Earth. And, you know, recent discoveries have been made of hot Jupiter-like planets where you have fast rotating planets close to the Sun. And we would expect, um, you know, since these have similar characteristics, these planets, then this kind of mechanism would be taking place out there, which is important because, you know, in our lifetimes, we won't be able to send a spacecraft up to an exoplanet. So by understanding what we have in our solar system, then we'll be able to, um, with other planets, take a leaf out of our book. So in summary, uh, this result showed an explosive nightside reconnection of Saturn, uh, probably the biggest, uh, you know, most explosive reconnection uh, event of, of any planet that's been discovered. Uh, and it also provides a significant pathway for plasma loss. Uh, and it has shown that, indeed, this process is able to shed away all the outgassing of Enceladus and on a much bigger picture, it's a new and important results for fast rotating magnetosphere and as well as reconnection physics. And if you'd like to know more uh, about this, you know, the paper has come out fairly recently, and I would really recommend everyone to, to have a read through. Uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting, important, and exciting result. And uh, that's, that's that for me. Thank you. Wow. 
<laughs> that was probably one of the most um, logical step through step um, comprehensive descriptions of a major result that at least the people in the room here have heard. Are there any questions online? Or I'll kick it off, actually. Um, I was wondering, given what has been observed at Saturn, what implications or predictions, if any, do you have for what might be seen at Jupiter? Yeah, so it is, uh, we definitely do expect something like that to happen at Jupiter. Uh, I mean, this is a mechanism that takes place at a fast rotating planet. Now, rotation at Jupiter is actually more important than Saturn because it rotates much faster. So we would expect that if we had an orbiter around Jupiter, for this kind of mechanism to take place over there, indeed. Uh, this is Nancy uh, Cooper, Solar System Ambassador from Bainbridge Island. So will Juno be measuring, um, making any measurements that will help us to see uh, uh, Europa's outgassing influence? Uh, so Europa for Jupiter? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so as in, as in if future missions will be doing that, I don't, it's not to my knowledge that there is a dedicated study that will be looking at the outgassing of Europa, but, but but the main source of plasma actually in in Jupiter is Io. It's it's uh, Io has volcanic eruptions, which is similar to the role of Enceladus at Saturn, and uh, so so yeah, that's 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 pretty much the main similarities. But uh, I'm not really aware of of, of any uh, dedicated uh, science to look at Europa, and it's not to my knowledge that Europa is a significant source of plasma in Jupiter's magnetosphere, and certainly nowhere near Io. So will uh, Juno be measuring Io's uh, contribution? Yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't, sort of, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, this is John Conn, Red Solar System Ambassador from Pennsylvania. Um, I also would like to compliment the logic and the, and the slides but my note taking um, unfortunately didn't keep up past slide five for a couple slides and they were very important. I wondered if you could just quickly talk about five to six and six to seven, the um, mechanism six. there with n so Sure, okay. Um, so, so, so I've broken this down into uh, two mechanisms for plasma loading and two mechanisms for plasma loss. And slide five is one of the mechanisms for plasma loss. But this process is, um, is unique to fast rotating planets. Now, once you get mass loading into the system, so on slide five, uh, the top-down view, um, as we're looking down into the planet, there's a prevailing rotation of, of the um, plasma. And what happens is, as the system becomes more and more mass loaded, the centrifugal force will stretch out the field lines, will stretch out the yes. plasma and the field lines. And sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I understood that one very well, and I was writing sure. down some notes, and I missed, I missed the next one, the one about Enceladus, the loading, and the one after that with the aurora. All right. Okay, six and seven. So, so uh, slide six essentially shows that Enceladus is the internal plasma source. It says that there's a moon going around Saturn, that has continuous outgassing of plasma, okay? And this is the um, most important mass source uh, in, in Saturn. Uh, the, ne the next slide was um, more like a sideshow, really, here, not really tied into the whole um, kind of story that I'm telling. It just says that uh, it's quite an interesting observation that if you look at Saturn's aurora, uh, you'll be able to see um, a spot, which is the footprint of, of um, Enceladus. So uh, it's a manifestation of the plasma that's being ejected by Enceladus. Uh, as Enceladus releases water group ions, these become ionized. And when they become ionized, they are able to feel the magnetic field line and travel along them into the polar caps of Saturn. And this is manifested as a bright spot in the aurora. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I had one question, Allie. A few years ago, I saw a really nice movie by, I think, Casey Hansen um, that showed sort of a model of, uh, you know, 
was sort of a, a one-minute movie that showed sort of the magnetosphere rotating and then reconnecting and spitting out a blob. Is this yes. uh, is this sort of sort of the data that says yes, that that is something that you can imagine is happening in the Saturn system? Precisely, that's exactly what's happening. It's just the different was was that in the past um, uh, it was thought that that could not keep up with the mass loading of Enceladus. So the estimates that were made uh, couldn't add up to everything that Enceladus was putting into the time and also the rate at which they were being released as well. So the difference with this result is it's exactly the same process as you've mentioned, but it seems to be a lot more explosive. The plasma content that's involved in this process is a lot larger. And so it means that this process alone is sufficiently to uh, is, is, is sufficient to give us the required mass loss of the system. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, I'd, before thanking our speakers, I want to remind people that uh, the anniversary charm comes in two delicious parts and part two uh, which will talk about Saturn and the icy moons and the rings, will be taking place on Tuesday, August 23rd. We have three wonderful speakers lined up for that. I'd like to thank today's speakers again, Zibby Turtle, who I know has already had to sign off, and Ali Suleiman, who has just given probably one of the best maps yeah, we, 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 we've ever seen. <laughs> I understood it so, all. <laughs> so I'd like to thank everybody very much, and we look forward to seeing you next month, and thanks again. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Recording has paused.